Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at DrPatientMovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we delve into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration and aiding you on your journey to optimal healing. Uh, guys, I don't know if you heard yet, but if you haven't, our movie, the documentary Dr. Patient is now out and available for rent or purchase or sharing or gifting. This has been a huge heart project for the past three years of really getting the message out about what it is to delve into the heart of suffering and illness, but also find strength and resilience in that process. So if you want to hear more or listen, or even just watch the trailer, go to drpatientmovie.com and let me know your thoughts after you watch the film. Okay. So on with today's episode today, I am so excited to talk about one of my favorite topics, um, with a wonderful, amazing guest, we're both part of a group called ICI, International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. And I just want to say he recently put out an incredible webinar on mold in the gut and mass cell activation. And I watched it. I thought we have to have him on the podcast. Dr. Pejman Kataria, Dr. K we'll call him, is a board certified pediatrician who completed his undergraduate at UCLA and then obtained his osteopathic medical degree at Western University. He completed a pediatric re residency at Loma Linda University, where he stayed on as teaching facility for over four years. Dr. K has also completed two fellowships in integrative medicine and has over a decade of clinical experience helping children with severe learning and behavioral challenges. He feels we must do more to help all of these children who are struggling. I couldn't agree more. And this is why he helped find found Holistic Minds, an AI holistic assistant to empower an army of healthcare providers to help families find and treat the root cause of complex chronic illness. Welcome, Dr. K. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. It is such an honor. And like I said, I, I watched this live. I have to talk to this guy. We haven't officially met in person, but we run in the same circles. I've seen your name on the boards and you always have insightful and important information. And I love your passion for children because so many of my patients, um, you know, if they're in a moldy home, the whole family's affected, right? Um, before we dive into mold and children and the gut, let's just talk a little bit about you and your story. I love to hear how did you get into medicine and then how did you get into a more integrative approach to medicine? Huh. Uh, so medicine, uh, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, in undergrad, uh, I realized that I was good in the sciences and I, I like helping people. So I figured naturally, well, what would you do other than medicine? Uh, I, I started the osteopathic school because uh, the more holistic kind of whole body approach resonated with me. And two years in, I, I actually, even with osteopathic medicine, felt really just disheartened by what I was learning, where it was just all very mechanical. 
kind of models. And at, I mean, as a second year medical student, you don't really know why you, you were struggling. But long story short, I started thinking like, well, gosh, maybe I shouldn't be in medicine and go into like healthcare administration or other things. And then I discovered pediatrics, absolutely fell in love with the kids. And to this day, they're still magical to me 20 years or so later. Uh, but in the midst of that, I went into pediatric residency and I was really trying to figure out where my future would be. And my program director is like, hey, why don't you try this holistic medicine stuff? Maybe it'll resonate with you. And, you know, it was like the second I came in contact with it, I was just absolutely and instantly in love. And that was, geez, 2000. 2005. And since then, it has just been an ongoing passion and just love to learn more. And ultimately, as as why you're doing what you do to to help more people find health and, and just lead healthier lives. Yeah, what an amazing story. It so resonates. And so many people I've asked that have been on the podcast, so similar in the sense of if you're a true healer and at the heart, you really, really care about people's well being. And that's kind of why you go into medicine. Then our conventional system lacks a little bit because we have drugs and surgery and it's more like a prescriptive here's this, but it's not that real deep connecting with people, understanding why they, I always say it's like that trajectory, right? And all of a sudden someone yeah. turned a corner and went into illness. And as detectives, you and I say, why did that happen? And then I love the pediatric because I think at the, I mean, there is no more true healer than someone who works with children because you really, um, you just have to have a special gift. So in that, I just honor your story. I honor what you're doing. And so important in the realm of complex chronic illness, um, before we dive into mold, what do you think is, I, I feel like what we've seen is this exponential increase um, even before the pandemic and for sure since that time of more complexity, more chronicity, more illness, and even in children, what are you seeing as patterns or things in the children that you see as far as the kinds of illness and the complexity and the background of what you're seeing? Well, uh, you're absolutely spot on. And it was actually two two years ago that you know, a bunch of colleagues, we were all reaching out to each other. We're like, what is going on? Like, there's so many more kids who are sick. There's so many more kids who are struggling. And I mean, we're absolutely seeing higher rates of, you know, A to B allergies, autoimmunity, but there's also a lot of kids. It, it, it's really turning into an epidemic of, of just learning disorders and behavioral disorders and autism. And like, sadly, Everywhere you look, you find one or multiple kids who are struggling with something. And it's it's just disheartening because it, it's almost like it's become normal now for kids to have something. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah my, my kid has an, you know, my, my kid has ADHD. And there was one of my close friends from college just uh, literally a week ago. He's like, yeah, we were so relieved that he didn't get the autism diagnosis and he just has ADHD. And, you know, it was in that moment, I'm like, my God, like, what <laughs> world do we live in where a par parent celebrates that their kid isn't autistic, but they have ADHD? Yeah. And, and I think like, that's the reality. Like, I, I in, my daughter is seven, she's in the first grade. And it's like, in every classroom, there, there, there are one or multiple kids who have some kind of learning disability. And, and we've just come to shrug our shoulders and say, well, that that's just kind of how things are. And it's sad. Yeah. Wow. That frames it so well, because I, I always say the elephant in the room is the environmental toxic load, right? And I think what's happening is subtly these smaller bodies are taking a um, a much bigger hit when we have mold in the environment or just chemical toxicity. I know as I delved into even Colorado water supply, this PFAs, which is polyfluorinated compounds, all of a sudden, all of our water supplies are testing for higher than the legal limits. And, and this is uh, these are permanent uh, forever chemicals, which means 50, 100 years down the road, we're still going to have them and probably more. And so our environment has a huge impact. Do you feel like that's part of the reason we're seeing so much of the uh, complex and in, in issues in children? For sure. For sure. And, you know, it's just become the perfect soup, right? You add some COVID on top of it, and then, you know, you add mold exposure or whatever else. It's just, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And for each of these kids, there's a different straw. It's sad. 
So how we got talking about this in our topic today is the gut and mold toxicity and how that all connects. And like you said, you probably are seeing more and more. Do you feel like for me, when I really realized what mold was, how it affected us, it was such an aha. And then I started to view that lens as I saw patients. And I was shocked at how many of my patients that had maybe presented with autoimmune issues or cognitive issues, or definitely kids with ADD or behavioral disorders, there was mold underlying that. How did you get into the world of mold and how how much how often do you see that playing a role in the kids' behavior or learning disability or issues like that? Uh, so how I got into it, this was about five years ago, five, six years ago. I had this one patient, uh, beautiful, I think he was eight or nine at the time, boy who had just a severe, severe case of pans and pandas, you know, just extreme aggression, extreme anxi anxiety, just you know, really off the charts issues. And we tried everything you can possibly imagine. Nothing worked. And the mom was the one that's like, hey, what do you think of this mold business? I'm like, well, right. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think it is, but sure, let's look into it. I, I Like all my stuff has failed. Like who am I to say it's not? And we did the urine mycotox and it, it actually didn't look terrible. But she kept persisting. And she's like, well, I found this guy, uh, Neil Nathan, who does consultations. Are you okay doing a consult with him? I'm like, again, I have no clue what the heck is going on. If he can shed some light, why not? And that was my first introduction to Neil. And, and he heard the story, heard the case, looked at the results. And he's like, oh, for sure, this is mold. And, you know, that's that's when my eyes kind of bulged out for a second. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? Like, uh, the, the test looks... Normal. Long story short, they tested their home and the levels of mold were so astronomically high that the conventional inspector, he wasn't even a fancy specialized one, is like, this this place is heavily contaminated, you need to leave. And wow. it was one of those stories where literally mom just packed their clothing, left the house, moved into a rental, like literally overnight. Uh, and that's what started opening my eyes up to this. And you know, it's terrifying how common it is. And there was probably a point about two years ago that I got to this point where I, I thought like I was losing my mind because it's like, it's not possible for there to be this much mold. It's not possible for this many patients to have it. And I reached out to Neil. And I'm like, Neil, am I losing my head? Like, is is it that I'm going crazy or is this real? He's like, no, welcome to my world. <laughs> this is real. And it's staggering. I mean, you know it better than anyone. It's everywhere. Yeah. Wow. It, you so parallel my experience because I had my personal experience in my office. I, we had a flood in Boulder. I got massive mold exposure. I was having symptoms, finally found out it's mold. And then I went on the journey to try to heal myself. And in the process, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a major issue. And then again, knowing that framework and seeing that one, just like your one case, all of a sudden you start to open your eyes to, oh, could this be involved in these other cases? And what I started to see was like over and over and over again. And I was so careful because I wanted to remain objective and not bring my lens to it. But the truth was I would be like, oh, this can't be mold again, right? And then I do the testing and then I do the story and then we do the, the environmental testing and it was so clear it was mold and they got better when they got out of mold. Mm -hmm. And to me, it kept being just like you, like, is this, am I crazy? Is this really real? But the truth is as we open our eyes and you and I both are in this organization that tries to get other physicians um, to be aware of this. And one of the reasons I do the podcast because it's so common, isn't it? It's sad and shocking. And the truth is like we as a physician can help the body, but if they are in an environment where they're swimming in toxic soup and there's a massive mold exposure, there's no amount of supplements or diet or medications that's going to take care of it, is there? No, no. It's a, I mean, if, if you're being exposed to constant high levels of toxins, then it, it's difficult. Uh, there, there are some techniques that I've found to be helpful for mild to moderate cases, but the severe cases where it's it's like off the charts levels, like th those are cases where you can't get people better. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, 
you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Yeah, which is why it's so great to have these groups and these people mm-hmm. that understand it to share and and Neil has been leading the way too. Um, so let's talk about the gut because again, where I got connected to you was this phenomenal lecture you did on is the gut really the root? And I love that because it's so true. In my clinical experience, I see that mold causes massive permeability and then that's our interface with the immune system. But do you want to dive into maybe giving the layperson who doesn't understand that connection, why is mold connected to gut dysfunction? And why does that affect the immune system? And maybe give us a little framework to, to put this all together of how mold affects the gut. Sure, sure. So, you know, I, th- I think a good starting point is to really contemplate on where penicillin and, I mean, frankly, all of our antibiotics came from. They're all derivatives of mold and mold toxins, right? Penicillin came from penicillium. And it turns out that most of the mold toxins that we have that, that are out there have direct or indirect antibacterial properties, which makes them exceptionally good for disrupting the microbiome or the microbiome uh, and all the bacteria in the gut. What also is really interesting to look at is this rather large body of information that shows us how the mold toxins and the molds themselves can trigger very weird inflammatory responses, especially within the gastrointestinal tract. And one of the things that makes it even more troubling is it's not just if it goes down this tube that we call you know, our mouth. When we inhale these toxins, it goes into our systemic circulation via the blood. And it turns out from essentially the inside out that these toxins can go from the blood in from the inner lining of the gut, and that can actually trigger an inflammatory response within the cells of the gut. And that inflammatory response essentially sets off this cascade of events that causes inflammation, which causes leaky gut. The more leaky gut you have, the more inflammation you get. And you essentially get this vicious cycle of inflammation, dysfunction, microbiome disruption, and all kinds of other weird things that essentially causes this perpetual loop that that has no end. And I mean, if if there's a 30 second summary of, of that presentation, it, it would be that. Wow. That's such mm-hmm. a great, you just did a perfect job of illustrating because it really does um, uh, massively affect the gut. And I'm assuming that you find, especially with your pediatric population, if you start with the gut, you're often going to get a lot of traction in a mold related illness case. Um, so maybe we can talk about like, where do you start with this? I just want to comment because maybe people are still not understanding. We have this microbial population that has more DNA in the microbial contents than in our own DNA. And so the composition, the types of bacteria and good guys and bad guys that we have in our gut has a profound effect on our heart and our brain and our immune system and every single system in our body. So when Dr. K here is talking about how this disruption happens, it literally, the gut is the ground zero for the whole body. So when we get this disruption, and maybe explain a little, because I'm sure you've seen this with kids, when you decrease diversity and all of a sudden you kill off with that antibiotic effect, some of the good guys, what are some of the things that can happen, like overgrowth of yeast or overgrowth of other bacteria that can cause issues, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, an analogy that I give to, for families to kind of help contextualize this is, you know, the, the gut bacteria are, are communities. And it, it's like having a small community of people where 99% of the people are good, loving, law-abiding, just good, good people. And then you've got the one percent that are the bad actors, right? Got a few too many tattoos. They, they, they've got some, you know, stuff. They have a, you know, they, they have violent tendencies, but because of the 99%, that 1% doesn't act out. When there's some kind of disruption and the 99%, let's say, drops down to 80%, and now the 1% is now more like the 20%, these bad actors suddenly have the ability to cause tremendous disruption within the community. So now they're looting and they're breaking in and they're setting fires and they're doing these things. 
And this, this dysbiosis, this imbalance of the communities is really where the heart of these issues come from. So as Dr. Jill pointed out, one of the things that's so fascinating is we all have candida in our guts. It, it's a normal part of the makeup of everyone's gut. And normally candida, this is just one example, is, is a non-actor. It, it, it sits there quietly. It's like the quiet little puppy that, that you pet and it's nice. It doesn't act up. It, it just sits there. When the community gets disrupted, the same puppy now turns into this rabid dog that is just trying to viciously attack everything. It actually goes through a morphological change. It changes its shape and starts spitting out these hyphae and actually becomes invasive, meaning it tries to start digging into the gut to ultimately get into us. And in the process of the candida and multiple other microbes changing their behaviors, they actually start causing all kinds of dysfunction, distress, inflammation within the gut, which then further causes issues. And what's amazing, and I'm, I'm sure you've talked about this before, is how these microbes, these fungi, these bacteria are sensing their environment. And they're sitting there quiet, quiet, quiet until like, oh, this is my opportunity to cause a bunch of mess. And that's when they start changing. Yeah. Wow. I can just see, I'm just listening to you with enthrallment because you've got such great analogies <laughs> in this. I can see how you be such a great pediatrician because even the kids can get what you're saying here, like the good guys and the bad guys. And it's so true, right? Like this is so candida. Let's just pause here a little bit because this is such a, um, in conventional medicine, there's systemic like sepsis from candida, which is pretty rare in the ICU, but we don't really talk about it. Right. And I know you and I, I'm sure have seen, I've seen in my practice, I'll just tell a quick personal story from years ago with cancer and then Crohn's disease. One of the biggest factors of me completely recovering from Crohn's was treating the massive fungal dysbiosis that I had. And it was something no one talked about. No one taught me until I really realized it for myself. And now I check those antibodies and I see, especially in Crohn's and colitis and definitely in kiddos that have dysfunctional behavior or, or cognition or mood, the candida is a big deal, Right. Um, how do you test or find out if that could be an issue? Is it clinical? Do you use some testing? And how often do you see that yeast overgrowth as a big issue in your kiddos? I, I, I love where you're going. And I would say it's probably at the heart of where most of the children's issues come from. Uh, and I, I would kind of expand out from the candida to just the entire fungal makeup of the gut. So the entire microbiome. When that goes out of balance, that I believe is one of the root causes of a lot of the issues that we see from behavioral issues. Uh, I'm working on a paper that talks about how that may be ultimately at the heart of part of what we call autism. Yes. Um, so yes, it's a big deal. Testing is is difficult. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen this in some of your patients. I mean, sometimes it's clear cut. You test antibodies and it's like, voila, the antibodies are positive. Or you do these organic acid tests and the markers are just screaming off the chart. There are also times that I've seen, especially in the children, all of these tests fail, at least at the first go. And really, it's just this clinical judgment of God, you know, this child was exposed to mold, their gastrointestinal tract is a big hot mess. They've got all kinds of sensory issues and anxiety and sleep disruption, appetite changes, pickiness, uh, which suggests that their gut is, is a really kind of distorted mess. And then sometimes I, I just have to work with the family and start treating. And then when we retest, certain markers have now gone off the charts. But like, that's the sad thing. There isn't this one test that's 100% you know, accurate all the time, right? It's uh, sometimes the tests can lead us, sometimes they mislead us. Yes, I love that. I love that you're seeing that because I have seen the same thing for decades. And it's so interesting because again, it was kind of through my personal experience that it was like, 
oh my goodness, this is at the heart of so much of my illness. And once I really got that under control, I don't have Crohn's anymore. That's considered incurable, right? But it's because I dealt with a fungal burden. And it makes sense. Again, I'm just going to for a moment talk Crohn's and colitis because there's panels on a conventional lab like Quest or LabCorp that it's an IBD panel. And you know what it is? You know this as well as I do. It's antibodies to certain types of yeast. And it actually indicates the severity of illness. So there's in the, even in the conventional system, although they don't acknowledge it, there's a clear cut um, researched and founded uh, connection to the fungal overgrowth. And I also like that you said there, it really ultimately can come down to clinical because we can do those antibodies. We can do the organic acids and the stool will get the colon, but if it's in the small bowel or elsewhere in the body, we'll miss it. And I think some of the things we see are these weird species like rhodoturia or you know, so even species like a Vaspergillus that aren't coming up on a culture. Um, but I just couldn't agree more. And I love that you're saying that because sadly, even in our functional friends, a lot of people aren't looking for fungal dysbiosis and it is so prevalent and so prevalent with mood inflammation, behavioral disorders. Um, are you typically starting with herbal types of treatments or are you using like Nystatin or Fluconazole or where do you start with kiddos? I, I really, I mean, one, I honor the families. And if, if, if there's a family that's like, I just want to use natural herbals, then it's like, okay, that, that's what we'll do. I find most of my kiddos who are, you know, really sick or really sensitive, they don't do well with herbals, at least in the beginning, because the, the mechanism of, of antimicrobial effect is so broad, right? The herbals don't just affect candida. They, they affect the entire microbial makeup. And I've had kids where like, there's a herbal blend called biocidin that I'm sure you're familiar with that has a bunch of different essential oils and botanicals. And there are some kids that even one drop of biocidin will cause them to go, just go completely bonkers, high anxiety, aggression, sensory issues off the charts. So what I've started doing in the last year or so is a lot of times I actually start with nystatin because it's, it's the least potent and the least effective of all of the things out there, including the botanicals. And it allows me to gauge how sensitive or tolerant a child system is. Because if a child tolerates Nystatin, easy breezy, you bring them up to a dose, they're doing great, everything is fine. Then you can layer in the next thing, whether it's a botanical or you go to fluconazole. Fluconazole. And then ultimately, what I've found to be really helpful for these kids is itraconazole. Yes. And it, it, that seems to be because aspergillus is, is showing its ugly face in the gut when it shouldn't. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I have come to really love Nystatin in adults and children. And in my mind, it's kind of like, you know, the antibiotics were taught uh, bacterial static and bacterial cytal. Cytal is the killers, statics is the stunners. And in the fungal world, in my mind, nystatin is more of the, if we say fungal static versus fungal cytal for the fluconazole. And in my mind, that's how I kind of think of it because I feel like the nystatin really um, pushes it down, but it doesn't eradicate it completely. But then on the other side, it's so safe. It's non-absorbable. It's safe in newborn infants with thrush. So we can use this very, very safely in adults and children. There's no liver effect. And because of that, you can use it a lot longer term. And some of the greatest successes I've had is keeping them on for months, if not even a couple of years on Nystatin. Wow. I, 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 haven't been that patient. <laughs> uh, I, I love that idea though, to, to just go slow and steady mm -hmm. for a long period of time and let their systems kind of recalibrate on its own. Yeah. That's brilliant. Mm. Well, we keep learning from each other. I love that's what I get to learn from you too. Um, so let's talk about we. Uh, so the connection between mold and fungus is usually mold weakens the immune system, and you so eloquently described it changes the the good guys bad guys ratios and things. And so what we're talking about now is fungal overgrowth that can often come in many different situations, but for sure in mold. But what about mold direct effect on the gut? Um, you mentioned the inflammation and the damage. Um, maybe just describe that briefly. And then where would you go with clients, patients, you know, kiddos um, with treatment of just the leaky gut and that inflammatory response? Yeah. So mechanistically, uh, th there are these cells in our gut called mast cells. And these mast cells are one of the surveillance, if you want to say, immune cells, uh, whose job is there to make sure nothing funky is happening. So it's like the security guard that's constantly kind of roaming the perimeter, right? And it, it's not just the mast cells, there's other ones, but there's a lot of mast cells in our gut. 
molds and mycotoxins happen to be very irritating to these mast cells. And it, it's it's like having the the worst irritating person you can possibly imagine for that security guard that causes them to go completely nuts. And when the mast cells get irritated, activated, they start triggering other cells within the gut to cause inflammation. And all of it is like, hey, alarm, something funky is going on here, something funky is going on. And then the more immune cells show up to try to fight this funkiness that's going on, the more damage they cause to the gut, the more leaky gut we get. And then at that point, the bacteria and the food proteins and all kinds of other things join in on the party, right? Because that that fence that was supposed to be nice and tight to keep everything on the inside of the gut is now broken. And all this stuff is moving past the fence to where the defense layer is. And the defense layer is now launching an attack on all of this stuff. And at that point, it really becomes this awful chronic cycle where food proteins, bacteria, the lipopolysaccharides, which are these essentially compounds that the bacteria release into their environment gets into it. And then the immune system is just like, okay, we've we've just got to wage war because the entire barrier is gone and we need to keep the body from dying, right? Because when the gut completely falls apart, we get what's called septic shock, right? Stuff comes in, ends up, heavens forbid, infecting other organs, and that's that's not a good thing for us. So the body invests a tremendous amount of immune force to protect itself within the gut, but that then causes even more damage, and that damage perpetuates everything. W- was that a decent explanation? That was brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> oh. And then what do you do? How do you start to, obviously, we kind of talked about the fungal overgrowth and those things, because you really want to take care of some of that first, but what would be some of the steps that you might recommend for a patient with leaky gut from mold? So, you know, a while ago, and this is what kind of led me down this road of, you know, understanding the gut. A while ago, I kept looking at some of my patients and asking like, why the heck can't I fix their gut? Right. Uh, and I'm sure you've had this experience or, where I would do the immunoglobulins, do the elimination diet, put them on probiotics, put them on all these things, and their guts would just not heal. And that's when I had this aha moment of, oh my God, like this environmental exposure plus what's going on with the fungal imbalance in the gut is where this kind of triggering, driving force comes from. The thing that I've added to this regimen are these bacterial endotoxins, these toxins that these bacteria produce. Because what I've started realizing is when there's the disruption, these bacterial toxins also start entering the gut. And mast cells and certain immune cells in the gut, they have these toll-like receptors, TLRs. uh, And these are like little antenna or sensors that are there kind of scoping things out to see what's good or not. And it turns out that these TLRs happen to be very sensitive to these bacterial toxins, and they start triggering these uh, receptors to activate these cells, which then furthers the inflammation. And where I'm going with all of this is, so what I've started doing is first making sure the environment is controlled. So whether someone has to leave a home, remediate, sometimes filtration is enough to just control the issues, the exposure. I start using my statin or other things to bring down some of the fungal burden because that's driving it. And then on top of that, I'll use various things to bind or prevent these bacterial endotoxins from going in. And what I found with that combination, that's usually enough to start calming down the immune response. So uh, serum uh, derived immunoglobulins, SBI, like SBI Protect or Meg- Mega IgG 2000. It turns out that these immunoglobulins are awesome, not just for le- preventing leaky gut, but actually preventing these bacterial endotoxins from getting in. Fish oils happen to be really good. Uh, I use chlorella sometimes for that kind of binding effect. And then if you look at a lot of the binders that we we have attributed to benefiting mold toxicity, the cholestyramine, well call, uh, bentonite clay, activated charcoal. It turns out that all of these binders happen to also be really good at binding these bacterial endotoxins. 
So one of the questions that I don't know if we have an answer to is when we use these binders and people get better, is it because we're reducing the mycotoxins or is it that we're reducing the bacterial endotoxins or both? Um, so we don't know, but you know, it's not so much the tools, it's really just the way of thinking about it that that's really changed for me. And it, it's coming at it from like, okay, we've got the fungal imbalance, We've got the bacterial toxins irritating the gut, and then we've got the gut that's irritated itself. So what are clever ways where we can reduce these exposures? And then on top of that, if they're parasites or food allergies, obviously we want to take care of that. And then find things that can help improve the gut. Uh, another example is quercetin. You yes. know, a lot of people use quercetin because it helps with mast cells. What most people don't look at with quercetin is that it's awesome as a prebiotic. So it actually starts improving the bacterial makeup. It actually starts reducing leaky gut. And there's one study that I found that suggests that it can also help prevent some of these bacterial endotoxins from coming in. So it's almost like repurposing the tools that we've always had. And it's just kind of thinking about it a little bit differently to ultimately just get things to move better. Uh, this is what I loved about your presentation because I was like, he is putting together the, so LPS endotoxemia, that's the bacterial toxins you're talking about that we know now that binders are also binding those. If you look at the research, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, it is at the core of all of our cardiovascular disease, our diabetes, our obesity, any metabolic dysfunction. And this is escalating. I think it's one in three now are going to be diabetic in this, this current age. And it's probably just increasing. It all starts at the gut, doesn't it? And it all starts with this LPS endotoxemia. And the other list of things, which makes sense with your kiddos, is um, things like depression, anxiety, insomnia, behavioral abnormalities, bipolar, manic um, episodes, rage all can be associated with this LPS endotoxemia. And I loved, again, when I heard your presentation that you pulled this together because it's almost like we need to think bigger. And just like in the mold and the mold testing, a lot of the um, experts out there are now talking about this toxic soup that's much more than just mold. It's bacterial endotoxins and um, mycoplasma and all these other kinds of things, right? So yeah. I really, really love that you broaden the scope. And what if it's actually the binders are binding the LPS and the bacteria more than the, the yeast or the mold? And either way, it works, right? That's the cool thing. But that makes so much sense. And like I said, I just love that you're bringing awareness to this because I think you're right on as far as per potentially this LPS, this bacterial coating is a bigger deal than the mold itself, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things that's terrifying me in the, that this is an area that uh, you know myself and some others are really kind of digging into is when you look into the autism literature, it turns out, so one, in the neurodegenerative world, there's also a lot of, I'm sure you know, the studies out there looking at these lipopolysaccharides, these LPSs and neurodegenerative disease and Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, and these compounds are highly, highly toxic to the brain. Uh, it turns out that there, there are several studies out there that have clearly shown that children with autism have significantly higher levels of these bacterial endotoxins versus healthy controls. And the higher these bacterial endotoxins are, the worse the severity of autism. And one of the you know worries that I have, and I have no idea if this is real or not, is what if what we call regressive autism is actually this tipping point where the child's gut is exposed to the toxins, exposed to the toxins, exposed to the toxins. It's kind of keeping itself together, keeping itself together, keeping itself together, whether there's an antibiotic, a virus, yes. excess toxin of whatever sold, including mold toxins, there's a breaking point, right? The gut loses its ability to keep it together. The microbiome, the fungus makeup gets disrupted. You get the leaky gut. These bacterial endotoxins now become big players mast cells become activated in a significant way. And then there's that tipping point where that poor child that was keeping it together can't keep it together. And now they enter this chronic state of toxicity that's gut mediated to ultimately cause these awful changes and losses that parents see. And in the handful of kids, it's not that I've treated thousands of kids, but probably at least several dozen in, I keep seeing the same picture where 
the family in, in and I'm sure there's a selection bias because these families are seeking me out, but the family had mold. They didn't know it or were not aware of it. Kid gets exposed, kids gets exposed, little things, you know, kid has colic, isn't the best sleeper, has some sensory stuff, but certainly is making eye contact, is still doing stuff. And then all of a sudden their system collapses. And it's it's just the saddest thing that we can prevent. I mean, like that's the beauty of this conversation. I'm sure it's why you do everything, right? We can prevent, we can help. There's so much we can do. Yes. Yes. I love that you're bringing awareness because I agree. This is why I do what I do is like, there's so many people out there that maybe can't see your eye, but if they hear this podcast and they start to think, oh, maybe my house, you know, there was a leak in my dishwasher and I just let it go. And now the floors are buckling. And so you start to see these things and you don't always need, need a doctor to get started if you just fix the problem or get out of the house or whatever it takes. Um, I had so many thoughts as you were talking. One is I just wrote an article on mast cell and psychiatric symptoms, right? And so interesting with autism, behavioral disorders, ADHD, there's a lot of literature and evidence that when those mast cells, those bodyguards throw out their toxins like prostaglandins and histamine, it actually preferentially affects the brain and some of our cognition, which is why it's associated with, you know, those kinds of things. But it's interesting because just, just um, behavioral disorders or mood disorders can be the number one presenting factor of mast cell activation, right? And then these kids, of course, you see that. And then the other thought, this is another side trail that I was thinking as you were talking, we talk about LPS, this endotoxin and the bacterial effect on metabolic how many more kiddos are you seeing with diabetes, pre-diabetes? And how is that? I think that's connected too, right? This gut and this metabolic dysfunction. And I don't know if you have any stats or just even what you see in clinic about how many more kids at a younger age are becoming diabetic or pre-diabetic. So honestly speaking, uh, I'm so focused on helping these kids with the neurodevelopmental issues that that, that other population is not uh, a big focus of mine, but I mean, we know that the rates of diabetes and prediabetes are through the roof and they're, they're younger kids and more kids having diabetes and prediabetes without question. What I can also say in the population that, that I take care of is, I mean, metabolic and mitochondrial issues are rampant. Yeah. Like I'd say at least 50% of these poor kiddos have either mito mitochondrial issue where the mitochondria are somehow not functioning optimally or a larger metabolic issue where their ability to break down fats, for instance, and turn that into fuel, these fatty acid oxidation errors are, are there. And it's, it's, it's so common that like, I, I almost just expect it to be there in pretty much all of the kids. And it's all related to these toxins, just mucking up the works. Yeah, no, I agree. And I'm the same way. I do this environmental toxic load and complex chronic illness and the classical heart disease or diabetes aren't really the patients that I see either. So it definitely, we have our, our niche for that. Um, one last thing here is just the idea. We think about environmental toxic load and the mold and all this stuff in our environment. But what you're describing is actually this inside out, like we are getting toxicity from our gut and that's the core of our conversation here is like this toxic overload is actually from the inside of our gut lumen and it's overwhelming our system. And it may be a bigger issue than the environmental toxic load from the outside, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the way I've come to see it is we have the outside outside toxin load, right? That that creates the vulnerability. In some cases, it induces the dysfunction within the gut. And then when we have the gut dysfunction and the leaky gut and inflammation and all of these other things, that adds a whole other layer of toxicity now from within that then causes essentially the systemic collapse because at a certain point, the human body just cannot handle that kind of toxic load. And you know these LPSs are highly, highly toxic. Uh, I mean, some of the... Like, they're deadly if if they're you know they're in high amounts and at a certain point our antioxidant pathways our liver pathways you know the gastrointestinal tract is a complete mess so forget about that being you know at all useful in detoxifying the body just gets to this point where there's no way that it can actually on its own recover from all of this toxicity and dysfunction and inflammation that's there and then the, these kids are just stuck. And I mean, that's the picture that I see, like 
Some of these kids have been exposed to mold when they were two, and I'm seeing them at the age of seven or eight, and, and they're still toxic. They're still stuck. They're, they're still struggling, and it's all because their systems just on its own could not repair yeah. from all this damage that's there. Mm, that makes so much sense. Um, so say someone's out there listening, a mom of a kiddo that has a behavioral disorder, or maybe just new diagnosis of autism or ADHD or any of these things, and they're resonating with what you're saying, and hopefully they can come see someone like you, but what kind of bit of advice or wisdom or hope would you give them today if they're listening? One, the answers are out there. There's always hope. There's always a possibility of things getting better. Trust your gut. I think this is one thing that you know a lot of parents, they know in their heart that there's something off and they know in their heart that there is an answer out there, but someone comes along and says, oh no, that's not possible, right? Whether it's their physician or whomever else. And I just want to say, trust your gut, trust your instincts and follow that and allow that to guide you because you will find the answers. You know, as, da- as Dr. Jill and I have discussed, there's so many answers and there's so much we can understand and there's so much we can do. And that just starts with you saying, you know what? No, there, I'm going to ask the questions and I'm going to keep asking the questions until I find the answers that I want. Dr. K, if people want more information about your programs, your website, where can people find you and what are you up to nowadays? So- uh, people can find me uh, one on Instagram. So if they go to Instagram, Holistic Kids, that's where I post a lot of my information. Part of what I really want to do is help a lot more families get access to this. And I wish I could be the primary person for every kid out there. That that's just not possible. And that that's why we created Holistic Minds. Holistic Minds is an AI platform that basically looks at all of the things that we talked about, you know, at these levels of bacterial endotoxins, fungal dys- dysbiosis, et cetera, and empowers providers to be able to see these things and be able to quickly access this information and most importantly, be able to do something about it. So for any of you that are interested, go visit Holistic Minds. And then with that, you can get teamed up with a provider that, that will be able to help guide you through this. Because I want every kid out there, every family out there to be able to access this kind of care and access this kind of information. And I believe technology is how we can do that at a very large scale. Love that. And where's the website where people can find this? So it's www, uh, holistic with a W. So W-H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C and then minds, plural, M-I-N-D-S.com. Wonderful. Thank you again for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you.